Welcome, everyone. My name is Ted O'Connell. I'm one of the authors of Crush Step 1, the ultimate USMLE Step 1 review. This is the second edition of the book, and we're going through it chapter by chapter. This is part two of the neurology chapter. We're going to start by talking about the anatomy. Each cerebral hemisphere is divided grossly into four lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. Each lobe specializes in certain functions. The frontal lobe provides crucial executive functions such as cognition, planning, decision-making, error correction, and troubleshooting. The frontal lobe houses the frontal eye fields, which are involved in voluntary eye movements. The premotor area, which generates execution or plan of movement, and primary motor cortex. The frontal lobe also houses Broca's area in the dominant hemisphere, usually the left hemisphere, regardless of whether or not the person is right or left-handed. And this is the area to which the motor aspect of speech production is linked. The function of the parietal lobe includes integrating sensory modalities and housing the principal sensory areas. The temporal lobe is involved in auditory perception. It is home to the primary auditory cortex. It also houses Wernicke's area in the dominant hemisphere in which written and spoken language is understood. Broca's and Wernicke's areas are interconnected by the arcuate fasciculus, which aids in language processing. The occipital lobe is involved in the processing and integration of visual information. The cortical homunculus is a pictorial representation of the ana anatomic divisions of the primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe and primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. It shows the portion of the human body involved in sensory and motor function mapped onto the cerebral hemisphere. It is important to note that some regions, for example, hands, face, and lips, are disproportionately larger in comparison to the rest of the body. This is because fine motor control and skills are needed in these particular parts of the body. More neurons need to be devoted to fine motor control of the hand when compared with the hip. The homunculus is important in allowing one to localize a lesion based on the specific defects noted on neurologic exam. The middle cerebral artery provides circulation to the lateral aspect of the cerebral hemisphere, resulting in neurologic deficits in the face and upper extremities if occlusion occurs, whereas the anterior cerebral artery provides circulation to the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere, resulting in lower extremity and trunk neurologic deficits if occlusion occurs. Basal ganglia. This subcortical structure is a group of nuclei whose main function is to modulate voluntary motor control. The basal ganglia are also involved in procedural learning, eye movement, and cognition. It consists of the following components. One, the striatum, which is divided, subdivided into the caudate, which deals with cognition, and putamen, which deals with motor control. Two, the globus pallidus, which is subdivided into the externa, the lateral external segment, and the interna, the medial internal segment, abbreviated GPE and GPI, respectively. Both segments have inhibitory GABAergic neurons that operate using a disinhibition principle. They are steadily firing at a high rate in the absence of signal, but may pause or reduce the rate in response to an in inhibitory GABA signal from the striatum. As a result, there is a net reduction of this tonic inhibition on their targets. Three, the subthalamic nucleus, which is the only portion of the pathway to produce the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. And four, the substantia nigra, which is subdivided into the pars compacta and the pars reticulata, which works in unison with the globus pallidus interna. The basal ganglia consists of a complex circuit that ultimately aids in communication between the cortex, thalamus, and basal ganglia. The signal starts at the primary motor cortex, the precentral gyrus, which projects excitatory or glutaminergic cortical neurons onto the striatum. From there, the signal can take two different directions, giving rise to two major pathways the direct excitatory or indirect inhibitory pathways. These are involved in triggering motion. The direct pathway stimulates it, 
and the indirect pathway inhibits it. Now let's talk about the direct or stimulatory pathway. Initially, the cortex stimulates the striatum. Through this pathway, the striatum inhibits the globus pallidus interna. Normally, the globus pallidus interna tonically inhibits the thalamus, so therefore the direct pathway inhibits the inhibition of the thalamus. Therefore, this leads to increased thalamic output to the cortex. The indirect or inhibitory pathway. Remember that indirect inhibits. This pathway is more complicated. Again, the cortex stimulates the striatum to cause inhibition. However, here the striatum inhibits the globus pallidus externa instead. The globus pallidus externa normally provides inhibition to the subthalamic nucleus. Therefore, this inhibition of the subthalamic nucleus is turned off when the striatum inhibits the globus pallidus externa. The subthalamic nucleus is ultimately stimulated to excite the globus pallidus interna. Recall that the globus pallidus interna normally inhibits the thalamus, so therefore increased globus pallidus interna activity leads to increased thalamic inhibition. Thus, the thalamus will have less output to the cortex. In summary, whereas the direct stimulatory pathway allows for increased thalamic transmission to the cortex by inhibiting the globus pallidus interna's inhibition of the thalamus, thalamus the indirect inhibitory pathway leads to increased globus pallidus interna inhibition of the thalamus and less thalamic transmission to the cortex. The interplay between the excitatory and inhibitory signals is mediated by dopamine via the substantia nigra pars compacta, the SNC. Dopamine stimulates the direct excitatory pathway upon binding to D1 receptors, while those binding to D2 receptors inhibit the indirect inhibitory pathway. Pathology with the basal ganglia, therefore, unsurprisingly, leads to movement disorders such as Wilson disease, tardive dyskinesia, Parkinson disease, and Huntington disease, which will be discussed later. Hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a major subcortical structure that consists of distinct nuclei that are involved in various functions. There's a mnemonic. The hypothalamus makes me very hungry for ham beets, where H stands for hunger, A for autonomic nervous system, M for memory, B for behavior, E for endocrine, E for emotion, T for temperature, S for sleep-wake cycle, and also for sexual urges. Instead of memorizing all the distinct nuclei and their individual functions, a better way to look at the hypothalamus is to break it into two contrasting regions, anterior and posterior, and two contrasting areas, lateral and medial, with distinct function. The anterior deals with parasympathetics and cooling. Destruction of this area leads to hyperthermia, for example, in a hypothalamic stroke. The posterior deals with sympathetics and heating, such as shivering. Destruction of this area leads to poikilothermic, cold-blooded individual. A functioning posterior hypothalamus keeps your posterior warm, like a functioning heater. The lateral area deals with thirst and hunger. It is stimulated by ghrelin. It is inhibited by leptin. There's a mnemonic. Lateral makes you hungry for a late night snack and makes your waist grow laterally. Destruction of this area leads to anorexia in adults and failure to thrive in infants. The medial area deals with satiety. It is stimulated by leptin. Destruction of this area leads to hyperphagia. The following are distinct nuclei of which you should be aware. The supraoptic nucleus and paraventricular nucleus will be discussed more in chapter nine. These two nuclei play a significant role in the posterior pituitary's release of antidiuretic hormone, ADH, and oxytocin. The arcuate nucleus plays a significant role in releasing hormones from the anterior pituitary. The suprachiasmatic nucleus receives input from the retina via the optic chiasm. This plays a significant role in circadian rhythm. You need enough sleep via the suprachiasmatic nucleus to be charismatic.
thalamus. The thalamus is a subcortical structure that functions like a switchboard in relaying sensory information to the cortex. It can be divided into functional nuclei. The anterior nuclear group relays input from the fornix to the cingulate gyrus as part of the papa's circuit. This plays a role in learning and memory. The dorsomedial nucleus relays input from the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. It plays a crucial role in memory, attention, planning, organization, and abstract thinking. A lesion of this nucleus is associated with Korsakoff syndrome, which will be discussed later. The ventral nuclear group. Ventral anterior lateral nuclei relay motor input from basal ganglia and cerebellum to the primary motor and premotor cortex and functions in coordination and planning of movement. The ventral posterior medial and ventral posterior lateral nuclei relay sensory input from the face via the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, and from the body via dorsal columns and spinothalamic tract. The medial geniculate nucleus relays auditory input from the inferior colliculus to the primary auditory cortex, medial from music. The lateral geniculate nucleus relays visual input from the retina to the optic cortex via the optic radiations, the L in lateral for looking. Pulvenar is involved in integration of visual, auditory, and somatosensory input. The limbic system, which consists of the hippocampus, amygdala, limbic cortex, fornix, and mammillary body, provides myriad functions such as memory, emotion, award, fear, pleasure, addiction, and olfaction. There's a mnemonic for the limbic system functions, the five Fs, feeding, fleeing, fighting, feeling, and sex. The ventricular system. The ventricular system is a set of caves connected by tunnels in the brain that is continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord and subarachnoid space. It contains CSF, which functions as a cushion in protecting the brain, providing buoyancy and suspending the brain against gravity and maintaining chemical stability. CSF starts in two lateral ventricles and moves into the third ventricle via the interventricular foramina of Monroe and then into the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. From there, it can flow into the central canal of the spinal cord or into the cisterns of the subarachnoid space via three small foramina, the medial aperture and the right and left lateral apertures. Because the foramen of Magendi, the median aperture, is, is the median aperture, there is only one, but there are two lateral apertures of Lushka. Once the CSF is in the subarachnoid space, it can flow down the spinal cord into the lumbar cistern at the end of the cord around the cauda equina, which is where lumbar punctures are performed, or it can flow around the superior sagittal sinus to be re resorbed via the arachnoid villi into the venous system. The ventricular system is implicated in pathologies such as hydrocephalus, an abnormal enlargement of ventricles, meningitis, ventriculitis, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, which will be discussed in more detail later. Cerebellum. The cerebellum is a structure located below the cerebral cortex and behind the pons component of the brainstem, where it plays a crucial role in the coordination, accuracy, and timing of our movements. It houses four deep nuclei, from which lateral to medial are the dentate, emboliform, globose, and fastigial nuclei. There's a mnemonic, don't eat greasy foods. D is a dentate, eat, the E, emboliform, G in greasy is for globose, and F in foods is for fastigial nuclei. Don't eat greasy foods. These nuclei receive inhibitory GABAergic input from Purkinje cells and excitatory glutaminergic input from mossy and climbing fibers via the inferior cerebellar peduncle, the ipsilateral proprioception input, and medial cerebellar peduncle, contralateral cortical input. Once input is received, modulated output signals are projected from the dentate nuclei by Purkinje fibers via the superior cerebellar peduncle 
to the contralateral VA and VL nuclei of the thalamus. Because of these connections, it is important to note that a lesion of the cerebellum results in ataxias, in coordination, of the ipsilateral side of the body. Based on anatomy, the cerebellum can be subdivided to understand the functional, functional denomination. 1. Lateral cerebellar hemisphere. Dentate nuclei aid in voluntary movement of the extremities as part of the cerebrocerebellum pathway. 2. Midline medial vermis. Interposed emboliform and globose, as well as vestigial nuclei, aid in balance and fine-tuning of body and limb movements as part of the spinocerebellum pathway. Flocolonodular lobe. Vestigial nuclei aid in balance and eye movements as part of the vestibulocerebellum pathway using visual and vestibular input from the retina and semicircular canals. Now let's talk about blood supply. Cerebral circulation is provided by the left and right internal carotid arteries and the left and right vertebral arteries. The anterior circulation is provided by the internal carotid, carotid arteries, which branch into the anterior and middle cerebral arteries. The posterior circulation is provided by the vertebral arteries, which fuse to form the basilar artery, which supplies the brain stem and cerebellum, which in turn branches into the posterior cerebral arteries. The left and right anterior cerebral arteries are connected by the anterior communicating artery. The internal carotid is interconnected with the posterior circulation via the posterior communicating arteries in the cerebral vault. Together, these connections form the circle of Willis, which allows for collateral backup circulation if one of the artery supplies becomes stenosed or occluded. The circle of Willis includes the anterior cerebral artery, anterior communicating artery, internal carotid artery, posterior cerebral artery, and posterior communicating artery. The cerebral circulation is supplied by three main arteries, the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries. Each artery supplies distinct parts of the cerebral hemisphere. The anterior cerebral artery supplies the anteromedial surfaces, which include the front and parietal lobes anterior portion of the basal ganglia and internal capsule, and medial motor homunculus. The middle cerebral artery supplies the lateral surf surfaces, which include the anterior and inferior temporal lobes, insular cortices, lateral surfaces of the hemisphere, and deep branches of the basal ganglia. The posterior cerebral artery supplies the posterior and inferior surfaces, which are primarily formed by the occipital lobe. Venous drainage of the brain includes superficial and deep subdivisions that connect at the confluence of sinuses before bifurcating into two transverse sinuses. The transverse sinuses travel laterally and inferiorly in an S-shaped curve that forms the sigmoid sinuses, which go on to form the internal jugular veins. Brainstem. The brainstem, which consists of the medulla, pons, and midbrain, is a continuous structure adjoining the brain to the spinal cord and has conductive and integrative functions. It includes many of the motor and sensory tracts, corticospinal, spinothalamic, and posterior column from the spinal cord, as well as motor and sensory innervation from the face via cranial nerves 3 through 12. The cranial nerves are outlined in Table 13. Dash one, which I'm unable to uh, replicate in this uh, audio version, but you can uh, take a look at that in the book. Uh, unlike spinal nerves, which emerge from the spinal cord, cranial nerves emerge directly from the brain, in the from the brain or cerebrum. A good way to remember where each cranial nerve emerges is the two-two-four-four rule, where the first two cranial nerves emerge above the brain stem. Those are cranial nerves one and two. The next two emerge in the midbrain, cranial nerves three and four. The next four in the pons, cranial nerves five, six, seven, and eight. And the final four in the medulla, cranial nerves nine, 10, 11, and 12. There's a mnemonic for, for the names of each cranial nerve. On old Olympus, Olympus's towering top, a friendly Viking grew vines and hops. There's a mnemonic for whether the cranial nerve, which is listed in order of cranial nerves 1 through 12, carries sensory signals, motor signals, or both 
Some say marry money, but my brother says big business makes money, where S is for sensory signals, M is for motor signals, B is for both. I'll repeat that. Some say marry money, but my brother says big business makes money. In addition to knowing the names and functions of each cranial nerve, it is important to know the pathway they take in the base of the skull. This is figure 18 in this chapter. These pathways become important when discussing pathology. Cribriform plate. Cranial nerve 1 goes through this and can be injured or transected in a trauma, for example, nasal fracture, which can lead to temporary or permanent anosmia. The middle cranial fossa, optic canal. Cranial nerve 2, the ophthalmic artery, and central retinal vein. The superior orbital fissure, cranial nerves 3, 4, 6, the ophthalmic vein, and sympathetic fibers. Nerve blocks can be performed here for lacerations in the V1 distribution. The foramen rotundum, cranial nerve V2. Nerve blocks can be performed here for lacerations in the V2 distribution. The foramen ovale, cranial nerve V3. Nerve blocks can be done here for lacerations in the V3 distribution. The trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, is packed full of so many branches of nerves that there is standing room only. That's a mnemonic for V1, superior orbital fissure, V2, foramen rotundum, and V3, foramen ovale. The foramen spinosum, middle meningeal artery, a branch of the internal maxillary artery. Trauma to the head can damage this artery and cause an epidural hematoma. Now let's talk about the posterior cranial fossa. The internal jugular meatus, cranial nerves 7 and 8. Schwannomas growing near this cause hearing loss. The jugular foramen, cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and the jugular vein. Lemire syndrome, which is thrombophlebitis of the internal jugular vein caused by head and neck infections. The foramen magnum, cranial nerves 11, spinal roots, brainstem, and vertebral arteries. Of note, this means that cranial nerve 11 begins outside the skull, enters the skull through the foramen magnum, and then exits the skull again via the jugular foramen, the only cranial nerve to enter and exit the skull. And finally, the hypoglossal canal, which is cranial nerve 12. The cavernous sinus. This is a collection of veins within the skull located lateral to the pituitary gland and superior to the sphenoid sinus. It drains blood from the ophthalmic vein and superficial cortical veins into the jugular vein. It is important to know the structures running through the sinus because pathology affecting the cavernous sinus can affect the structures running through it. One mnemonic for remembering the contents is O Tom Cat. Oculomotor nerve, which is cranial nerve 3. Trochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve 4. Ophthalmic nerve, which is cranial nerve 6. Maxillary nerve, which is cranial nerve V2. Carotid artery, the internal. The abducens nerve, which is cranial nerve 6. And the trochlear nerve. When looking at the orientation of these structures, it is important to note that the abducens nerve and carotid artery run through the middle of the sinus, whereas other structures run along the lateral walls. There's a mnemonic. Cranial nerve 6 sticks to the carotid. All the nerves pass through the superior orbital fissure, with the exception of cranial nerve V2, which exits via the foramen rotundum. The most commonly tested pathology of the cavernous sinus is the cavernous sinus thrombosis, where a blood clot forms in the cavernous sinus, usually as a result of an infection nearby spreading into the sinus. Classical symptoms include visual changes, exophthalmos, from an enlarged cavernous sinus pushing on the eye, headache, and cranial nerve palsies. The most commonly affected cranial nerve is the abducens nerve, cranial nerve 6. Spinal cord. The spinal cord houses the major motor and sensory tracts that interconnect the rest of the body to the brain. It consists of three major motor and sensory tracts, dorsal, posterior columns, lateral corticospinal tracts, and spinothalamic tracts. 
Each specializes in conducting specific sensory information to the brain. The dorsal column provides ascending pressure, vibration, touch, and proprioceptive sensory information. The dorsal column is organized such that the axons responsible for touch sensation of the arms are located laterally, while those responsible for the legs are located medially. The lateral group of axons are called the fasciculus cuneatus, conveying sensory information from the upper body and upper extremities via C2 through T6. And the medial group of axons are called the fasciculus gracilis, conveying sensory information from the lower body and lower extremities via T7 and below. There's a mnemonic. Dancers are graceful because they know where their legs are, thanks to the fasciculus gracilis. The spinothalamic tract provides ascending pain and temperature sensory information. The axons of the spinothalamic tract first ascend, travel rostrally, for a few spinal cord segments before crossing into the spinal cord via the anterior white commissure, anterior and midline in the spinal cord. The lateral corticospinal tract provides descending voluntary motor information to the contralateral limbs. These latter two tracks are organized as if someone is diving into the spinal cord, where the hands are medial and legs are lateral. The dorsal, posterior columns, and lateral corticospinal tracts cross sides in the brainstem, whereas the spinothalamic tracts cross in the spinal cord. This nuance is important when talking about injuries to just half of the spinal cord, such as in brown saccard syndrome, which is discussed later. Spinal nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system, where they exit the spinal cord carrying a mix of motor, sensory, and autonomic signals. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, which include 8 cervical spinal pairs, C1 through C8, 12 thoracic pairs, 5 lumbar pairs, 5 sacral pairs, and 1 coccygeal pair. Cervical spinal nerves, C1 through 7, exit above the corresponding vertebra whereas the remaining spinal nerves exit below. The clinical significance of these nerves is that each spinal root supplies a specific myotome and dermatome, which can be used to localize lesions depending on the neurologic deficit seen on exam. For example, if vertebral disc herniation occurred at the nerve root between L5 and S1, the most common site of disc herniation, this could lead to difficulty with toe walking. Important dermatomes to memorize in local lesions include T4, the nipple, T10, the umbilicus, L1, the inguinal ligament, and the various parts of the feet. The medial foot is L4, the top of the foot is L5, and the lateral foot is S1. The auditory pathway. The ear is divided into three sections, with each playing a unique role in detecting sound. The external ear acts like a satellite dish to capture pressure waves, sound, and focus them on the eardrums. The air-filled middle ear contains three ossicles, malleus, incus, and stapes. These ossicles mechanically convert the low-pressure vibrations at the eardrum into amplified high-pressure waves to cause fluid, perilymph, movement in the ear via the oval window. This fluid movement stimulates hair cells in the inner ear, the cochlea, which transforms this mechanical movement into electrical signals in neurons. The electrical nerve impulses are now transmitted down cochlear fibers to the brain via the vestibulocochlear nerve. Before reaching the thalamus and being relayed to the primary auditory cortex on the temporal lobe, they are processed at intermediate stations, such as the cochlear nuclei and superior olivary complex of the brain stem and inferior colliculus of the midbrain. The vestibular pathway. The vestibular system is another component of the inner ear, which is dedicated to balance. Three canals, oriented perpendicular to each other, provide sensory input for rotary movements, with the horizontal canal detecting horizontal head movement, for example spinning, and the superior and posterior canals detecting vertical head, head movement, such as nodding the head. Each canal opens into the utricle and has a dilated sac at one end, the ampulla, which houses the crista ampullaris, hair cells and supporting cells, in a gelatinous structure, the cupula. Each canal is filled with endolymph, which lags behind as the head moves. This lag pushes opposite of the cupula, causing hair cells to bend, and depending on the tilt of the hair cells, excitatory, depolarizing, 
or inhibitory neural sig electrical signals are generated. The visual system. The eye muscles are innervated by three cranial nerves, cranial nerves three, four, and six. A good way to memorize which muscles are innervated by which cranial nerves is to think of the fictional molecule LR6SO4R3, where the LR, the lateral rectus, is innervated by cranial nerve 6. The SO, superior oblique, is innervated by cranial nerve 4, and the, the rest innervated by cranial nerve 3. Damage to a cranial nerve leads to sp specific findings when looking at the eye and testing these ocular muscles. The eyes convert light waves into electrochemical signals via the retina. Light is first refracted by the cornea, goes through the pupil, the opening that is controlled by the iris, and is further refracted by the lens, whose shape is changed by the ciliary body, to project an inverted image on the retina. The retina consists of layers that house two types of photoreceptor cells, cones, found in high density in the fovea, which is the most sensitive part of the macula. These are responsible for color perception, high visual acuity, and are light adapted. And the other type of light adapted cells are rods, which are found in the retinal periphery and are responsible for black and white vision, night vision, and low visual acuity. It also houses bipolar cells, which are an intermediary in transmitting signal from photoreceptors to ganglion cells. Photoreceptors contain, contain rhodopsin, rods, or photopsin, cones, which are comprised of a large plasma membrane, opsin, bound to retinol, a vitamin A derivative, that is very important in the visual phototransduction process, turning light into an electrochemical signal. Ret retinal exists as cis retinal exists as cis retinal, which changes configuration into transretinal on light exposure and leads to activation of transducin, a G protein, which activates cyclic guanosine monophosphate, cyclic GMP, phosphodiesterase. This enzyme breaks down cyclic GMP, leading to closure of sodium channels, hyperpolarizing the cell and stopping the release of neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters generally inhibit the bipolar cells in the dark, but in the light they allow bipolar cells to transmit the signal to the optic nerve. The signal is carried from the optic nerve to the optic chiasm, where nasal retinal fibers cross over. Nasal retinal fibers are those fibers on the retina closest to the nose, whereas Temporal fibers are those on the lateral retina closest to the temples. Beyond the optic chiasm, the optic nerve continues as the optic tract, which carries the crossed and uncrossed fibers of the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. From the LGN, the signal is carried to the pretectal nucleus of the midbrain, involved in pupillary reflex, and the visual cortex in the optic lobe by optic radiations. The optic radiations are split into two parts. Fibers from the inferior retina, Myers loop, carry information from the superior part of the visual field, passing through the temporal lobe by looping around the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle and synapsing in the occipital cortex. Fibers from the superior retina, Baum's loop, carry information from the inferior part of the visual field on a shorter pathway, which is less susceptible to damage, through the parietal lobe. Lesions along these pathways from the retina to the visual cortex can lead to various visual field defects. In the pupillary light reflex, neurons from the pretectal nucleus run to the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, which receives bilateral input from the pretectal nuclei. From here, presynaptic neurons synapse at the ciliary ganglion and postsynaptic neurons innervate the pupillary sphincter muscle causing pupillary constriction or meiosis. Electroencephalogram, or EEG. Similar to how an electrocardiogram records the electrical activity of the heart, an EEG records the electrical activity of the brain. Clinically, neurologists can use the EEG for diagnosis of epilepsy, coma, encephalopathies, and brain death. It is important to keep the following in mind. When awake with eyes open are beta waves 
which are high frequency, low amplitude. With eyes closed, alpha waves. Sleep. As discussed earlier, the circadian rhythm is oscillated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, which is regulated by one's environment, that is, light via photosensitive ganglion cells. The pineal gland acts as a transducer upon stimulation by norepinephrine release from the suprachiasmatic nucleus to release melatonin. As one goes into deeper stages of sleep, these waves slow down. Stage 1 is theta waves, pre-sleep or nodding off with slow eye movement, also known as relaxed wakefulness. Stage 2, sleep spindles and K-complexes, most prominent form with no eye movement, accounts for about 50% of sleep during the night. Stage 3, delta waves. This is the stage where sleepwalking, bedwetting, parasomnias, and night terrors occur. And finally, rapid eye movement. Beta waves. The EEG looks as if the patient were awake, but the muscles are paralyzed. REM sleep is when dreams occur. Disrupted REM sleep is thought to be the cause of dream paralysis. Disrupted REM sleep is associated with alcohol, benzodiazepines, and barbiturate use. That's the end of this section two of the neurology chapter. In section three, we'll be discussing pathology.